So hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us and I continue discussions on the application of behavioral science in the UN context. My name is Mary, I'm a behavioral scientist by training and I lead, uh, well I'm here in two roles actually. I lead what's called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which is an initiative of the UN Innovation Network and brings together colleagues across the UN system. But also I lead what's called the International COVID-19 Behavioral Insights and Policy Group alongside, uh, well, with organizers, uh, Tim Chabron from Public Health England and Amara Martinez from the Western Cape Government in South Africa. And uh, this session will cover COVID-19 vaccination and global uh, lessons learned, uh, um, featuring a report that will be launched right now <laughs> in, in, over the course of the session. Uh, so just wanted to flag a little bit here up front about UN Behavioral Science Week. Uh, this is an event that's taking place in the larger context of the week. Uh, there are a few sessions to happen today as well as tomorrow, including a discussion with Professor Cass Sunstein. So uh, I encourage you to check out the agenda if you haven't already. Here it is, and it should be in the chat shortly. Um, so you can, you can see it there. So in terms of today's webinar, just a quick logistical note, we will be que collecting questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. So not the chat, but the Q&A box. So please put them in there and upvote those of your colleagues so we can have a, a session that resonates um, with most of the audience. Okay, so on to today. So we're very fortunate to have some keynote remarks uh, from Professor Katie Milkman. Uh, she doesn't need much introduction, I think, to this group, especially when it comes to COVID-19 vaccination. She's quite, uh, her research is, is quite well known. Um, so she's the James, uh, G, James G. Dynan Professor at Wharton, uh, which is at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the co-director of uh, Behavioral Change for Good, which I'd encourage you to check out if you haven't already. They have some really interesting studies with respect to applying behavioral science to achieve social impact through some really interesting and innovative partners. Uh, she's also the author of a recent book, How to Change, which outlines a number of ways we apply behavioral science, um, and just insightful new applications to that as well. So with that, Katie, over to you for a few remarks. Uh, thanks. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I'm excited to get to share um, some of our research on this topic with you all. So here we go. Um, hopefully screen sharing is working. It's always magical when it does, even after a year and a half of practice. I'm excited to tell you about two mega studies that our team has conducted on nudging vaccination. And actually I'll tell you a little bit about one project in progress in the next 10 minutes. So here we go. Uh, the first thing I wanna highlight is that there are lots of different ways that you can think about changing decisions regarding vaccination. And our team has focused specifically on converting intentions into actions because there tends to be a gap in this place. So this is different than persuasion. It's really more about, I, I mean to do it, but I might not get around to it because my intention isn't strong enough or I, I, don't, I don't follow through. So it turns out that we don't follow through on many of our intentions. This is just a graph showing a bunch of different activities where people said, I absolutely plan to do this. And then you can see what the actual follow through rate was. And then I'm gonna focus here on flu vaccination because about a year ago, almost exactly, my team was thinking about doing some research on flu vaccination, trying to close this action, in, excuse me, intention action gap. And with COVID, taking over the world, we recognize a huge opportunity to try to develop interventions by, that we could test to nudge flu vaccines in the fall of 2020 so that we would have insights available in time to influence how we communicated about the COVID-19 vaccine because there are a lot of similarities in terms of people I need to do this. I know it's good for me, but maybe I'm a little nervous about getting a shot. I'm not positive. I absolutely need to do it. And so maybe I won't follow through. Okay, so recognizing this opportunity, we decided to put together what we call a mega study, or Hi, actually Katie. two mega studies Katie. to test what messages promote vaccination. And a mega study is, is what it sounds like. It's a really big study. Instead of testing a single hypothesis about something that might change behavior, we tested dozens of hypotheses in parallel so we could make apples to apples comparisons about which things work best. And we went to a team of about 150 scientists who work with us at the Behavior Change for Good Initiative um, globally and asked them to come up with their best ideas for messaging that would encourage vaccination. And we asked them to come up with messages that would encourage flu vaccination, but that they would expect might port over to change behavior when it comes to COVID-19. And I just wanna emphasize, we know from our past research and also from this study, that if we had just done surveys, which is what was easily available to do at that time and said, hey, do you intend to get a vaccine? We would get really different results than if we measure actual vaccinations. And that's why we felt it was so important to use this proxy instead of just 
uh, measuring intentions. And so, so that's what we did. Okay, so the first study I'll mention was a mega study that we did with two local health systems in the, in the Pennsylvania region, um, Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health, and it involved 50,000 patients roughly who had healthy checkups scheduled with their doctor at some point during the fall of 2020 and would be encouraged to get a flu vaccine during that checkup. And the question was, could we increase the rate at which people actually accepted the vaccine? So we went out to our team of scientists, they came up with lots of different ideas for things that might be effective. We tested all these different ideas. And what we found happily is that, um, that actually many of the messages we tested were effective. So if you go to the next slide after this one, you'll see the results from our, our, tri our first trial. And what they show is that uh, Sorry. <laughs> About a third of the messages we tested effectively increased vaccination, but the very best performer was a message that said a, a vaccine has been reserved for you. So that message may work because it conveys something related to the endowment effect. So once we own something or feel it belongs to us, we tend to value it more. And in addition to that, we may be conveying that it's a recommendation. So once someone feels that a flu vaccine is recommended for them, they may be more interested in actually taking the vaccine. And finally, uh, another element of it is it may seem like it's less of a hassle. And when we did uh, an analysis of what types of messages were most effective, because about 33% of the messages that we tested did significantly increase vaccination, what we see is that um, two attributes jump out. One is conveying it's reserved for you. So three of the 20 messages we tested use that language. If you could advance two more slides, you'll see the one I'm talking about. Perfect. Oh, no, back. <laughs> thank you. Back one to the uh, graph of the results. Perfect. Thank you. So um, the, the top three performers all use this language that a vaccine has been reserved for you. So on the x-axis, you're seeing the estimated increase in patients who accepted a vaccine. All of the dots that are red are statistically significant improvements over uh, control. You can see that sharing a joke about the flu was not effective at all, which was disappointing, but also good to learn. Um, so the other thing that jumped out in the attribute analysis besides saying it was reserved for you and was that more clinical language was useful. So the more casual and interactive the message, the less effective. So I realize we're short on time given all of my technical difficulties, but I do want to tell you briefly about our second study because I think it's important to see just how robust these results are, which was a surprise. So if we advance actually two slides, you'll see that we did... Um, Oh, sorry, this is, this is my takeaway slide. So we, we have this evidence that behavioral science works, that reserve free language was very effective, and that was, a, that, that was exciting. So if we go forward one more, I'll tell you about our second study briefly, which was a mega study with actually almost 700,000 people run by, uh, in, co in cooperation with Walmart pharmacies, where we message their customers. And now instead of trying to get someone to accept a vaccine when they are coming to the doctor's office already, we're trying to convince people to drive to the pharmacy and ask for a vaccine. So it's a different action. We thought different things might work. If you advance, you'll see we tested different ideas, though there was some overlap in the messaging strategies tested here too. And these texts went out at the end of September on, uh, on September 25th. And then uh, three days later, in some cases, there was a follow-up message. And we tested a wide range of ideas from, you know, do it for other people or everyone else is doing it. A shot is waiting for you, which is as close as we could get to the reserve for you language, uh, given concerns about, you know, what happens if we're actually out of stock. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see the results from this trial. And I want to emphasize we are really well powered here. So all of those red dots, every single message we tested improved over their standard of care, which was not to text message people encouraging flu vaccination. So these text messages definitely work. But there's also significant variation in how well they work. And again, interestingly, we had a message that essentially was very simple and conveyed a shot is waiting for you a similar a similar message to it is reserved for you. Uh, which was the best performer. And the lift, again, is about a 10% increase over baseline. Though I should note that um, whenever you look at a distribution, the outliers are probably skewed. If we did a replication, I wouldn't expect to get quite that large of an effect. But, but that is our best performer in both of our two sites is essentially saying it's waiting for you or it's reserved for you. 
Okay, so if we advance, I will try to wrap up fairly quickly. I did include a slide just showing you how simple these messages are. Just looks like what you'd expect to get from your pharmacy. And again, in an attribute analysis, the more casual and formal messages that looked different from what you'd expect to get that were interactive did worse. And the ones that use this waiting for you type language, which was just a few, did, did the best. So if we advance, I'll wrap up uh, here and say that this is more evidence that behavioral science can help nudge vaccination, that two reminder messages encouraging people to get their flu shot um, and tell you it was waiting for you. That's That was our top performer. And again, this congruence, this consistency with what you expect to receive and suggesting that it's available seem best. So I think I'm already a minute over time. Uh, let me leave you with one last slide, which is just telling you about something we're doing right now. Um, if you advance one more, I'll show you that in Philadelphia, oh, excuse me, I lied. <laughs> this is my, these are my sort of best takeaways. One more, I'll tell you that in Philadelphia, we're doing um, a vaccine sweepstakes. You've heard about these around the country, but we designed one in, in the city of Philadelphia that's much more localized where we are having three drawings and people know that they could win, or excuse me, they could be contacted whether or not they're vaccinated and they'll have to decline the prize if they aren't vaccinated. You can only win if you're vaccinated. So it's called a regret lottery. And we've also selected one zip code from the 46 in the city for each drawing at random that is um, at, has half the prizes. So we're trying to see if really localized lotteries are powerful, uh, even over and above a standard lottery. So we'll have results up from that soon. And let me wrap up and apologize again for these technical challenges. Thank you so much to everyone for rolling with me and finding a way to make this work. And, and I hope the rest of the event is fabulous. Thanks a lot, Katie. Um, we have a, a quick question. Would you mind just, I'll turn my video on, but would you mind answering it just before you? I'd be delighted and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it won't get logged out. <laughs> You're good, okay. Um, so it's from Yvonne. Yvonne, would you like to ask it yourself to Katie? If not, I can also ask it too. Okay. One second, Mary. I'm bringing Yvonne in. Yvonne, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvonne from BBC Media Action. And my question was that um, this behavioral science or nudge focused approach focuses on messaging at people. And I worry that a focus on this approach ignores a massive truism about vaccine communication best practice, which is needing to engage in two-way communication, addressing legitimate concerns and questions, um, as opposed to this kind of unidirectional didactive form of communication, and was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. I think the two are complementary strategies. So we're, we certainly, I would never suggest that, that, that there isn't an important, I'd even say key role for a back and forth, you know, between trusted sources and anyone who's hesitant. These are really meant to be complementary to that. This is a message designed to close an action and tension gap. It's not a persuasion message. It's not a substitute for a conversation costs less than a penny to send these messages and they have a 10% increase in vaccination as a result. So incredibly cost effective, simple strategy that should be deployed in, in combination with other tools that are conversations to, to help address hesitancy. So this really, I want to be very clear, it's not, a, it's not a substitute for persuasion, for talking about people's real concerns. It's a complement and it closes a different barrier to vaccination that I think is often neglected because we focus so much on hesitancy and forget that sometimes just making it really simple and convenient can, and, um, and messaging about it in a clear way that it's going to be hassle-free, it's available for you, we've set it aside, here's where you can get it, um, it's recommended, those kinds of things can also help. Great, thanks for that, Katie. Uh, just one more question if you can squeeze it in. Um, Mariana from the European Commission, if you'd like to ask yourself, please go ahead. Hi, yes. I hope you can hear me. I was uh, just wondering, uh, since you said, if I understood correctly, that at Walmart they never sent SMSs before uh, your experiment. If you are going to rerun it to see if uh, this was somewhat partially driven by a novelty effect. Oh, that's interesting. Um, 
So I, I believe that they're, they will be using these messages in the future, given the effectiveness. I'm not too concerned that it was a novelty effect, given that uh, it's once a year that they communicate with people about vaccination. So this wasn't like a weekly um, message that they are planning to roll out. It's, it's, it's at a low frequency. Uh, we feel pretty confident that the results we've obtained are are going to be robust, but certainly they'll, uh, so, so I don't expect them to test again, given how very strong this test was. Uh, and, and generally we don't see evidence of wear out effects when something's happening at a rate of once a year. If you were texting people every week, you might expect there could be some kind of issue, but, um, but at this kind of frequency, I don't think that's a, a serious concern for them. Thank you. I hope they don't abuse of the SMSs now that they've seen that they worked. <laughs> there are actually legal constraints that will prevent that from happening. So, uh, you know, you're not allowed to use this for marketing. These are people who um, had, had I should have actually said this. These are people who had opted into getting messages from their pharmacy and who had at some prior point gotten a vaccine from a Walmart. So those are constraints on who they can contact. And that is an issue with this kind of technique that uh, there are laws that prevent you from spamming people, which are good. And so when we think about how do we use text messaging, it, it of course has to follow the law and there are some limitations. We may want to port these kinds of communications into other um, venues as well, mail, uh, as well as, you know, we're seeing people do this on social media, posting about it's reserved for you, email, and so on. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. We could, we could talk about this for hours, but um, we do realize we have the rest of the session to get to. Um, so thank you so much for, for your comments. And we've learned a lot in the last few minutes here and very inspired by all the research you've done. So thank you. And, thank um, you for having me. Apologies again for all <laughs> the technical glitches. I'm glad we got through it. No, <laughs> Take care, great. everyone. All good. Thank you, Katie. Okay, now on to our panel for today. So I'm fortunate to have with us, I'll just pull up some slides now as I deal with my own technical... Um, we're fortunate to have with us um, colleagues who uh, might sound familiar to the group for <laughs> being engaged with us for the last year in the COVID-19 Behavioral Insights and Policy Group. Um, we have uh, people who submitted to the report we're publishing today, which uh, have the submissions from many of you. It's on COVID-19 vaccination, and it should be in the chat, the link to check it out. Um, it's coming out today. It's coming out right now, actually. So this is the official launch. Um, so we'll be hearing from Ellen Mosca, who's from the World Bank, where she's a behavioral scientist. Also Pippa Ranger at the UK government, who's um, an innovation advisor in the F uh, Foreign Commonwealth um, FCDO, as well as Pompa Dubroy in the US government. She works in the uh, Office of Evaluation Sciences, where she's the um, strategy and operations lead. And lastly, Robert Murphy in the Government of Ireland and the Department of Health, where he's a senior economics and research officer. And all of the colleagues here have done work on vaccination and behavioral science, so and COVID-19 in particular. Um, so there's lots to explore. So with that, um, on to our first panelist, um, Ellen. Could you explain a bit about your work that you submitted to the report and um, yeah, the work of the World Bank overall with respect to COVID-19 vaccination? Yes. Um, let us hope that everyone can see my slides. <clears throat> so today, um, I'd like to talk about uh, behavioral, behaviorally informed um, social media strategies to understand vaccine hesitancy. Um, our aim in this project has been to use a social media survey to gain behavioral insights into vaccine perceptions. Um, and we do this by First, diagnosing intentions, which means to understand behavioral drivers of hesitancy and then develop a typology of various personas as they relate to, um, to subtypes of hesitancy. Um, and then to test messages that are intended to increase vaccination intention. So kind of taking the, <laughs> taking the persuasion approach where Katie's work focused on um, getting people who already intend to do the action, we're focusing primarily on trying to shift intentions. Um, and then with the information gleaned from this to offer customized support to country partners, which includes communication recommendations, but also some things that will hopefully go beyond simply communications um, into behavioral solutions for implementation. And so um, how do we do this? <laughs> so we're doing this through a multi-country initiative that's a collaboration with 
several uh, groups within the World Bank led by Embed, the behavioral science uh, unit in the World Bank, um, and also partnering with Facebook and um, obviously country governments. And what we're doing is uh, using a survey that we recruit people um, through Facebook ads. We conduct the survey through a messenger chat bot, which has been a really interesting approach that's worked quite well and I'm, I'm excited about using in the future. Um, and we, we typically run this very quickly. It's a couple of weeks per country to get between five and 10,000 responses per country. Um, and it's, it's coming in at a very low cost under $1 a survey. So far we've completed in eight countries, we've got 22 more either underway or on the docket coming up quite soon. We're aiming to scale to a hundred countries. Um, and so far our total sample is about 70,000 respondents um, and growing very fast. And the key takeaway that I want to leave uh, that I want to leave everyone with today is that there are many types of vaccine hesitancy. When we talk about hesitancy, we need to move beyond just talking about averages or very basic demographic groups like gender, race, age, um, and target specific personas that embody the underlying drivers of vaccine hesitancy. In our initial work. Um, largely drawn on our first batch of countries which are concentrated in the Middle East region, we've diagnosed five very distinct types of vaccine hesitancy, well, four, four personas around hesitancy and one uh, vaccine champion <laughs> personas. Um, and these, these personas are, are um, defined by, ver by very distinct characteristics um, where behavioral aspects are much more important, in fact, um, of predictors than the than demographics. So for example, we can think about um, a group that we're calling low trust, that distrust the institutions associated with vaccine development and rollout and messages that target them really need to take a completely different approach from the group focused on safety concerns who are generally pro-vaccine, who trust governments and other institutions a great deal, but have specific concerns around the novelty of the COVID-19 vaccine. And you can see how those two groups would be very different. So in the next step, we're planning to rapid test messages aimed at these particular personas to see how we can um, address them more effectively and in a more nuanced way. Great, thanks so much for that. There's a lot in there we can unpack. Um, just had a question regarding how you think about representation in the context, uh, internet and Facebook penetration is limited. How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important thing to think about. We have been um, thinking about this in kind of two different ways. One is trying as best as possible to get as much representation as we can through the survey. We, um, we target our surveys to people in kind of different demographic buckets that are defined based on population characteristics that we get from uh, population representative survey data. So we try to mirror the distribution of those population characteristics in our sample, meaning you know, age groups and regions um, so that we ensure some degree of representation within the obvious constraint that not everyone in a country has a Facebook account. Um, and then the other way in which we try to think about this is to consider that while our sample is not representative um, at the national level and, and could never be because it's a, it's a social media survey, it is representative of a very important and influential demographic, which are people who seek out and share information on social media who are active there and who will be important conduits of that information to their communities. And so they're um, a very important group to target with uh, in this work and to understand um, in, a more, in a more nuanced way. It's really interesting how you've been able to how you've been able to leverage that. Thanks, thanks so much for mentioning that comment. Um, I did want to mention as well. I neglected to mention this earlier. This report is published with the World Bank, so a thank you to you and to Abby Abigail Dalton and everyone as well, the World Bank, as well as um, Kiara Klitzner from uh, who's working in the Western Cape government in South Africa with Amara Martinez. She's also put a lot of effort into this, so just wanted to acknowledge that as well as we go forward because I I missed that in the. And then mix up with all the slides, I, I'm not oriented here, but thank you for that. Thanks, Ellen. This has been quite, um, quite, quite insightful. So we'll come back for more of a panel discussion at the end, but I'm going to go to the next panelist now. 
Um, so next over to uh, Pippa Ranger from FCDO in the UK. Could you explain a bit about your work? And, uh, oh, I'm going to share your slides as well for you. Um, one second, I'll do that right now. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, okay, so um, I, I, I guess um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what we've been doing at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to um, apply behavioural science in support of the vaccine rollout in the Global South um, and a, a few, few key learnings that, that we have um, along the way. So this is a really critical time. Um, there's uh, increasing COVAX deliveries to many countries, but there's also um, an emerging third wave coming out um, in, in many places as well. Um, so there are also significant challenges in the Global South, logistical, um, there's less capability for things like applying behavioral science um, to, to the response. Um, and there's a, a whole host of, of things like conflict, um, health system pressure, um, a, a widespread hesitancy, lack of trust in governments, misinformation. There's a lot of challenges to, to get through. Um, so we've been focusing on, but there's also significant experience from things like Ebola and, and polio mass vaccination programs that have been um, rolled out successfully in, in many countries and in, in the global south. Um, so what we've been doing is um, focusing on um, the next slide, Mary, um, some technical support, um, really trying to build capability and mainstream behavioral science into the vaccine rollout. Um, and this has included um, a continual learning emphasis, um, knowledge sharing between partners and academics and, and um, policy officials and, and um, people in, in our country programs, um, and really trying to share things through our forum that we, we um, have, uh, we meet every two weeks, and a webinar series that has brought in experts and implementers um, and academics to share learning along the way. So we're really like, we're really building that into the response and working with the with the, with the vaccine team and all our country programs. Um, and providing technical support as well through our hygiene hub at the London School of Tropical Medicine, but also directly in-house. Um, and we've produced, co-produced with the partners in the forum, um, some guidance which is a really has been a fantastic product to just be able to give and share to people. Um, and it, it contains really easy to use um, behavioral design checklist and that kind of thing. Um, so our, in terms of our approach, the next slide, Mary, um, we've, um, we're encouraging people to spend a lot of time doing whatever they can to um, understand context and barriers using experience and, and evidence that we already have, but also really delving into the country situation and the, the complexities and different communities in those countries, and then design multiple different interventions and approaches over time. And where possible, testing um, interventions. So our, our partners at the Behavioural Insights team have been working with our British Embassy in Colombia to um, test uh, vaccine intent messages, for example, on um, using messages and influences um, to understand how we might increase that intent to get vaccinated. So where possible, we're doing this and we're looking at doing this in, in more places as well. Um, so the next slide, please, Mary. In terms of this, some three, there's lots of learnings that we've, we obviously have and lots that we put into our guidance and into the brief that Mary shared today. Um, but three key things that I wanted to share is that um, in many places that we're finding there's a, um, a real lack of trust and it could be trust in the vaccines themselves, it could be um, hesitancy created by um, mistrust in governments or previous rollouts of vaccinations and it really does vary which is obviously it emphasises the need to understand the barriers in place in particular countries um, and communities but um, the, the thing that Yvonne said, and actually one of our partners is BBC Media Action, and um, one of the things that's really important and that we've been um, supporting our partners to do is really build on existing community engagement networks, um, media platforms, campaigns that are already existing and trusted, getting down to that real micro local level in terms of social influences like community leaders, religious leaders and health workers. Um, 
and and creating a real space for listening and respectfully listening to um, people's concerns and and giving them dignity in that process um, and creating space at that very local level and then translating um, intention into uptake what Katie was talking about making it as easy as possible there are possibly some real low-cost things that can be done to um, overcome that hesitancy um, and and make it as easy as possible like even Save the Children have reported from their research, people taking 30 minutes out of their paid work is a real barrier to, to getting people actually vaccinated. So how can you make that as easy as possible, getting to a very local distribution of vaccination? Um, vaccinations through, could be through trusted um, places like faith centres. It could be getting it really close to people's work um, around markets. We've been doing a lot in the UK with mobile pop-ups going into places like Chinatown with a bus um, and it's getting as local as possible and, and so that people have to take as less time as possible to get um, to get vaccinated. Um, and, and then looking at other ways of making booking systems and registration uh, um, easy as well. And then the other thing that's really emerging as, as something that's very important and our hygiene hub are really focused on, on supporting this is continue the protective health measures and the hygiene behaviours because actually in the global south the, the rollout of the vaccination is going to take a long time we're talking you know a, a significantly longer time than in in other countries that are already well underway and and we're also seeing third wave coming um across places like africa and and, and we all know what's been happening in asia as well and um, so it's really crucial to not just focus on building confidence in vaccines, but also reinforcing the need to continue um, behaviours, for example, in Zambia, um, sorry, N Namibia, there's um, less mask use. So what can we do to improve that? How can we build hand washing stations into the vaccination centres? How can we leverage existing campaigns and, and build, pave the way for the vaccination drives, but also continue to reinforce those those um, really essential health protection measures. So I'll stop there. Sorry, oh, hi. technical challenges here. Um, very helpful. Thank you for explaining more about the context uh, and, and the importance of kind of thinking about the, the global south in this. Um, you mind if we come back in the in the panel session? I'm just trying to figure out the timing here, just to ensure we have enough time for the panelists. So maybe we'll just we'll ask you a follow-up question in the in the panel at the end, if that's all right. Thanks. Okay. Now on to our our next panelist, who is Pompa De Broy from the U.S. government. Great. Hi, Pompa. Hi, Mary. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, let me just try to share screen here. Can you see my slides? Excellent, great. Um, well, hi everyone, it's great to be here. Um, and thanks Mary and the World Bank for preparing um, the brief. So my name is Pompa De Broy. I'm from the Office of Evaluation Sciences at the US General Services Administration. And our team worked with um, several US government agencies, including formerly the National Vaccine Program Office and currently OIDP at HHS to test eight different um, large scale evaluations of different interventions to increase vaccination rates. Um, and we recently put out um, a report on what we've learned from those studies as relevant to increasing COVID-19 vaccination rates. What I'll start out saying is that these are not specific evaluations um, to test um, increases to COVID vaccines, it's routine adult immunizations, including flu vaccines, uh, childhood immunizations, and adult immunizations. But we thought that some of our lessons learned may be applicable to this context. So I'll give a quick introduction 
to our team. So we are based at the US General Services Administration. We're a team of interdisciplinary experts that work across government to evaluate and work with um, different government agencies on their priority outcomes of interest. And as I mentioned before, we worked with HHS as well as with several um, other government agencies, including Veterans Affairs, CMS, State Departments of Health, and a few private facilities as well to test eight different evaluations to increasing vaccination rates over the course of 2015 to 2019. Um, and our team publishes everything that we do on our website. So you'll see if you go to oes.gsa.gov, we have all of our evaluations on our website. And we think it's important to share both what works and to give you a preview what doesn't work um, so that agencies can adapt and change what they're doing. So this is a summary of the different projects um, that we've worked on. And as you'll see, there's various different population segments. We worked with Medicare beneficiaries, pregnant women, adults, school, um, school age and daycare children, veterans, as well as clinicians and school administrators. Um, and our evaluations in general were pretty well powered. So we had a range of sample sizes, but the average was 55,000 individuals that were included in each study. And we tested various different modes of communication. So many of these were behaviorally informed communications, including emails, letters, social media, um, postcards. We also had one clinical reminder that we designed in an EHR system. And these were generally low cost interventions that could be done or embedded in existing work that agency collaborators were doing. And they all um, targeted different stages of the behavioral journey, as you'll see here. And so we wanted to share some of the lessons learned that we thought would be valuable. And I know that we have time to discuss these in more detail later as well. Um, but some of them include behaviorally informed direct communications can increase vaccination rates, but may have smaller or less reliable effects than the published literature suggests. And so, um, for instance, in our uh, two of the eight evaluations we tested did find significant yet small increases in vaccination, which did result in hundreds of additional vaccinations. Um, however, um, our meta-analysis of these eight inter evaluations showed a small and statistically non-significant overall, overall effect on vaccination um, uptake. And we think it's reliably um, are unlikely to reliably generate effects of more than about 0.6 percentage points at scale. Um, so we thought that was an important lesson learned from these low cost behaviorally informed communications. We also think that rapid cycle evaluations of large scale interventions to improve vaccination uptake are essential to learn what works in the real world. So I think it's important to learn both what does work and what doesn't work and to embed evaluations in already ongoing efforts um, and to learn what works for subpopulations as well. Um, two of our other lessons learned are around cost effectiveness um, and designing vaccination administration systems. And so, for instance, it is possible to design vaccine administration systems to support simple randomized evaluations. We worked with um, state immunization systems that enabled random assignment, as well as registries and EHRs for data collection and analysis. Um, and this helps um, be able to test things rapidly um, and at scale. And then fourth, um, more evidence is needed about the return on investment of these types of communications relative to other efforts. And so collecting data on costs to design and deliver these uh, interventions will be valuable. Great, thanks for that, Pippa. It's really helpful with all, all the variety of uh, experiments you've run, the insights you've shared, so thank you. Um, so we're going to have to save your, your follow-up questions um, for the Q&A, but, um, but thank you. I uh, will now move over to our next panelist, Robert Murphy from the Department of Health in Ireland. Let me just... Thank you, Mary, um, and thanks to, to all the organizers for the invite today. I'm just going to uh, share my screen now. 
I think Pippa, you might need to stop screen sharing. Great. Okay, is that is that working there? Yes. You can see my screen, yeah, great, brilliant. Can you? Yes, it's working. Go Excellent, ahead. okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, so basically in Ireland, we have a national public health um, emergency team and it advises the Minister for Health on the health sector's response uh, to the pandemic. And it, its advice then informs uh, government decisions. There's also then a COVID-19 communications and behavioral advisory group, and it, it advises the Department of Health. Uh, and I'm a member of that group. And we have a particular focus in relation to insights on the departments and the health service executives vaccine communication strategies. And in a presentation, I just wanted to give a flavor of some of the work that we've done uh, and some of the findings. So from November, uh, we've had a weekly public opinion survey on COVID-19 vaccination intentions. And that's identified really that the majority of people indicated that they intended to receive the vaccine. And that's thank thankfully been in increasing steadily since the end of November, um, up until we started the vaccine rollout really. Uh, it helped to identify what the key kind of worries were or concerns for those who were hesitant. And it was also useful in that it identified that people with anti-vaccination views are very much in the minority. It's certainly less than 1% of the population. So it was useful in identifying for us the, the need to kind of uh, support those who have the positive intentions and then provide the relevant information to help others to, to make informed decisions around whether to get the vaccine or not. So we decided also to build on that Irish data by undertaking a review of 20 plus international papers. And again, it identified generally positive intentions um, but still plenty to play for in terms of trying to achieve the uptake rates that are required for herd immunity. It also was useful and it gave us a better understanding, not just of the reason, reasons gave, people gave for unwillingness to vaccinate, but also for, for willingness and what were our kind of key drivers. It gave us a better understanding of groups with lower intentions, as listed in the slide, and also predictors. So not just demographics, as mentioned earlier, past vaccine behaviours, but also psychological factors in terms of impact. Built, uh, building on that international review, we looked at some of the Irish data for over 2,000 participants from the 1st of March. Sorry, Robert, we can't hear you. I'm not sure what's happened to your sound. Okay, can you hear me at all? Yes, you're good now. Please good now, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, don't move. Okay. You heard the first slide, could you, hopefully? <laughs> yes, yes, we heard you right up until now. You're, you're good. I, I didn't want to have to repeat it all again. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Uh, so in terms of the second slide, what we decided to do, we, build, we decided to build on the international evidence and review some of our Irish data to undertake a predictor analysis. So we identified key factors associated with positive intentions and three really key drivers were concern, not having concerns about getting the vaccine, uh, trust in health service uh, providers and also institutions, and then a belief that one's own choices and behaviours could make a difference in ending the pandemic. Um, we also found that people who thought they had the virus were, were negatively associated or didn't intend to get the vaccine. And then these findings were reinforced by a number of other studies undertaken by members of the SRI who are members of the group too. And it really emphasised as well the importance of people associating the vaccine with a benefit. Given that most of this work focused on intentions, we also then looked at uh, actual behaviours and we did a meta-analysis of over 37, of 37 interventions of RCTs to look at flu vaccine uptake in adults and whether or not um, supplementing mass media campaigns with direct written correspondence increased uptake. And we found a pool a meta-analysis effect of, of 18%. And then we also then looked at the letters or correspondence that had, were shown to have an effect and analyzed the most common elements or messaging within those and incorporated those into our, our, our messaging. And finally, then we produced a summary paper of 15 key points to support uptake of the COVID vaccines uh, in Ireland. And these insights and the inputs from the members were reflected in the communications and rollout in Ireland in terms of the broadcast of social media, information leaflets, a recent booklet we have for all households and endorsements by, by, by key uh, entities. Um, and that's a, a, a sample of the key, key work we did in this area. Great, thanks Robert. I'm sure you could continue on much longer than this. There's a lot of work that you've carried out and it's really inspiring, the, particularly the early days of the pandemic when uh, how much Ireland had done such a short period of time. So 
really great to see you so much in the Department of Health there. So Thank if you. you stop sharing your screen, um, we can pull in the other panelists as well, have a bit of a discussion uh, amongst ourselves. So I have a few questions. Um, can we pull everyone else in? Great. Um, so I have a few questions for uh, each panelist, but feel free to comment um, and respond to, to responses as well. This goes to any panelist. So for Ellen, um, what are some of um, some lessons learned regarding running surveys in multi-country contexts that, that may be relevant to other colleagues? Yeah, this has been really challenging during um, for this particular topic because we talk a lot about you know the COVID vaccine um, and the COVID vaccine rollout, but in fact countries have different compositions of the vaccines that are available to them. Everybody has a different health system, has a different vaccine uh, prioritization process. And so um, we are coming to countries at varying points along their rollout. In some cases, we've conducted our survey prior to any um, vaccinations being distributed. In other cases, at the very early stages with high priority groups, and in other cases, once they're much more widely available. And so um, the sort of the thing that I think we've done to kind of balance that with the need to maintain some comparability across countries in order to understand what's happening, you know, regionally and globally is to try to understand like which things are going to change according to the stage of the vaccine rollout and design like um, different generations of surveys that address concerns relevant to various phases in the vaccine rollout itself and then which things are likely to be important throughout and really keep this core set of questions to allow us to see how things are changing over time, calendar time, how they're changing according to the stage of the vaccine rollout in a particular country and then how they're also um, maybe similar across regions, for example. Um, but <laughs> it's definitely been a really challenging and policy, fast moving policy environment to work in. Hunting lots, lots of challenges. Yeah, too many to, to talk about here. Um, but thank you for that, Helen. Uh, okay, so next I have a question for Pippa, if you're still here. Um, yes, uh, regarding just overall challenges and lessons learned uh, regarding addressing COVID-19 in the global south, what are, what are your reflections and thoughts? On challenges. So, I mean, I talked, to, I did, um, I th everything's frozen, so I don't know if you can hear me at all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Okay, great. So I guess I guess there are the the challenges that I talked about in terms of the the need to um, continue adherence to protective measures and hygiene practices. I think that's a real um, a real challenge, um, and uh, and and one of the things that we are um, trying to do is embed that into national government public health promotion. Um, as a as a regular sustainable thing, um, and I've, and that's one of the ways that um, that needs to continue and then be integrated with existing um, campaigns building in the the vaccine stuff. So I think that's that's a real challenge. Um, also, I think um, there are, are there's a lot of evidence and things on testing SMS um, invitations and booking systems online. Um, and that may not be hugely appropriate or possible in many contexts. So I guess it's also trying to find out um, ways that are appropriate as well as building capability and, and um, the capacity to do those, those kinds of things as well where it's possible. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just, just the fact that a lot of the evidence um, broadly has been coming from um, more developed countries and uh, we're really focusing on trying to build build that evidence base with colleagues at the World Bank and, and UNICEF um, who are doing experimental testing in um, Ghana for example and we're looking at expanding um, some of the work we're doing with Behavioural Insights team that have, they've started in, in Colombia and other countries. So um, that's, that's something that's really challenging but um, it is you know there's so much going on now um that uh i think it's really positive 
Great. Thanks for that, Pippa. I think, you know, can't, the hy hygiene side of it, we can't always forget that. We're often so focused on the vaccine. It's thinking about the, the hygiene component as well. And yeah, lots of lessons learned to be shared um, from the global south too as we go forward. So, so thank you. Um, okay, so on to a question for Pampa. What are some um, challenges or lessons learned with respect to extensive field randomized controlled trials and, and the work that you presented? Yeah, I would say um, in addition to the sort of four takeaways that we had from our studies, I think one is that this is obviously informative, not just, you know, for the sake of research, but also to inform the practices and efforts that um, agencies and organizations are doing. And so um, one, this can be really embedded into the work that they're doing currently and can learn systematically from their current efforts. Um, and in some cases, for instance, we varied timing of when something was sent. If it wasn't uh, possible to randomize or include a control group. Um, and then in other cases, you know, we, we, um, we changed the type of messaging and tested that against other type of messaging and saw what worked better. Um, and I think a lot of these organizations have budgetary and resource constraints and so it's helpful to learn both what works and what doesn't work so that they can redirect some of the efforts um, and i think that was helpful in terms of utilization of the evidence um, that that we saw coming out of this um, and so I, I would say that that's quite valuable and testing generally is quite valuable especially for subpopulations there's so many efforts going on right now and so it's it's important to learn um, from the efforts that we're doing systematically great thanks for that pampa um, always always helpful to learn more about testing um, okay so if i don't mind panelists could you stay on for a few more minutes just past the hour just so we can get through a few questions here thanks um, so last question for robert and we'll try to squeeze one in from the audience as well um, so if you have a question, put it in there and vote the, of your those of your colleagues. Uh, so Robert, it'd be interesting to hear about the challenges and lessons learned, particularly with the advisory group you mentioned. Um, it's quite interesting, I think, a potential model for other governments and international organizations. Um, what are some lessons learned from that, particularly in the COVID-19 context? Sure. Um, I think um, some of the things that have worked really, really well in, in terms of an advisory group like that I mean, first of all, the, the members of the group have direct access to kind of key decision makers. So, for example, that group was, was chaired by the head of communications in the Department of Health. Um, so it meant that the group, which is made up of key uh, behavioural scientists and academics and from, from an academic or research centres in Ireland, but also in, in agencies and departments in, in Ireland, had direct access in and could have kind of open and honest kind of discussions around what we know and don't know and, and what might be useful. Um, I think another kind of key benefit from working kind of with it from inside government like that was just the, the opportunity to, to kind of build trust within the group. Um, a lot of people will have known each other from beforehand and have established trust and communications and making changes is always so much easier then. It also gave people a, an opportunity to, who mightn't have known each other as much from the policy maker's side or from the academic researcher side to work directly and, and, and build that trust. Um, I think as well, we've had some like massive collaboration from that group. So at times, you know, we were we meeting weekly and, and reviewing data weekly. So that's that's been like a hugely kind of positive input and getting different perspectives on it. But also some of the studies that we undertook. So some of the studies I was involved with, they wouldn't have like the meta analysis. We had people from UL and and DCU and so on, kind of inputting into that. Um, um, you know, without it, without a, a, a charge, if you like, to the department, which is really useful, or from LSE or NUIG and the SRI and so on. So it was massive in terms of being able to kind of achieve those sort of collaborations and outputs as well. Um, and then it meant as well that the group could input into what are kind of small but can be significant things in terms of reviewing content for SMS messages or our recent uh, booklet that went to all households, uh, your COVID-19 vaccine. So. Uh, you know, it was really, really useful from that point of view, and, and they'd be the kind of key kind of takeaways with direct access, trust, collaborations, and then being able to kind of shape and input into outputs that colleagues across the health service and the department are, are working on. Great, 
Thanks for that, Robert. Um, that's really insightful and helpful for colleagues. Um, so let's try to squeeze one question in um, that was answered. So Hamilton from Brazil, would you like to ask your oh, question? Hi, I'd like, I'd like to ask the following question. Uh, Dave Dacker, which is considered the father of branding, he defended recently the use of fear of use uh, uh, in personal stories to motivate, especially the that segment of hesitant people. Have you any have any of you considered using fear of use to reach this difficult to reach uh, segment? Over to the panel. Any comments? Um, I can just mention uh, that we are we are testing now. We're starting a phase of testing these various messages at, um, aimed at different personas um, that we identified in our survey. And one of the groups, which is the the sort of uninformed and unconcerned group, we do have some messages that try to highlight the total number, for example, of deaths. Um, from COVID in a particular country to make the risk of not vaccinating more salient. But I think it's, it's kind of a, it's a double-edged sword because you want, you know, you want people to understand the risk and to, to see it as salient, but you don't want it to go all the way into fatalism where people feel as though, you know, they, they're just at risk and there's nothing they can do or they get so overwhelmed that they um, are trying to have a hard time making a choice. So we'll have some, more data-driven responses to that, I hope soon. Um, but I think it's a very, it's probably needs to be tested very carefully and be very uh, personalized in order to avoid kind of the pitfalls of scaring people so much into um, inaction. Uh, Go ahead, please. Okay. Maybe just to add, I suppose, just to, to point out as well from, from our analysis of the data in Ireland, certainly worry or concern about um, the virus is a significant driver of kind of positive intentions to get get vaccinated, but it's, it's not one of the kind of top three drivers, if you like. Um, so, and I think I'd, I'd shared a few a kind of caution. We specifically kind of didn't try to drive that that fear uh, emotion um, and try to emphasise more the, the the benefits of the vaccine. Um, but you know, also making sure that the relevant information is there in terms of consequences. So again, if you look at the, the flu vaccination uh, literature that we analyzed and the content analysis, um, you know, the third most common con factor in those sort of letters are around just the statement around the seriousness of the flu and possible complications. So we, we certainly didn't try to emphasize that, but uh, at the same time, there's there was, there was no kind of getting away from preventing the facts and, and the figures and so on. But um, that's how we approached it in Ireland. All right, thanks for that, Robert. If there aren't any other comments. Um, we just wanted to now bring in, conclude today's session, say thank you very much for the presentations and the discussion. Um, it was really insightful uh, to hear from you again about your, your cases that are in the report. So if you want to hear more about what's been today, I encourage you to check out the document. I also wanted to bring in uh, my colleagues, Mara Martinez, as well as hopefully Tim Chabern and Abigail Dalton, but I don't know if they're here because we've gone over time. Um, but just to say thank you to them as well for all their effort and work into running the group and uh, keeping our, our discussions going. Um, so, so yeah, thank you to everyone for joining and um, looking forward to seeing you at another event, hopefully over the course of the week or um, applying behavioral science other day. So thanks everyone.